Amen. That make you want to just find a good place to pray? Hold that thought. We'll have plenty of chance this week. I will give you a chance after the message. That's why we have invitations. Take your Bibles this morning. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. Ecclesiastes 10. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes in your Old Testament. Right before Song of Solomon and Isaiah. Ecclesiastes chapter number 10. Look with me in verse number 8, please. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse number 8. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you, Lord, for uh, sweet fellowship with your spirit, with your people. Uh, Lord, the uh, congregational singing, the special music, the songs of Zion. Uh, it's just good to be in church, Lord. It's good to be saved. I pray for your blessing upon the message. Help it to come forth, Lord, in a manner that would uh, benefit uh, each and every person that hears uh, just as much as it possibly can. Uh, use it, Lord, I pray, uh, to enlighten our eyes and strengthen us uh, to your work. And, and Lord, just to glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, interesting verse, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse number 8. It contains the first two of four consecutive warnings that are given in Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verses 8 and 9. Uh, those warnings being, number one, he that diggeth a pit shall fall into it. Uh, number two, whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Uh, number three, whoso removeth stones shall be hurt therewith. And number four, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. Uh, this morning, we're going to consider and concentrate on warning number two, which is, whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. My message this morning is, uh, don't break your hedge. Point number one, uh, the hedge is a hedge of protection. Uh, by definition, Webster in his 1828 dictionary, which was the first American dictionary of the English language, and Webster or no Webster makes uh, a lot of references to the Bible in that dictionary, but um, uh, he defines it as such, and uh, hedge, uh, the, the hedge is a noun. Properly, a thicket of thorn bushes or other shrubs or small trees, but appropriately, such a thicket planted round a field to fence it. So the idea of the hedge would be um, a, a row of shrubs, bushes, etc., that would go around a field to, to serve as a fence, to fence it in. Um, hedge is also used as a verb. And when used as a verb, uh, by definition, uh, Webster's uh, number two definition under it being a verb, it says this, to surround for defense, to fortify. When we talk about this hedge as being a hedge of protection. That is what it does. The hedge I'm going to speak about in this message is a spiritual hedge of protection that fences you in to shield you from harm while allowing you to flourish with the in, within the inside of it, it, flourishing in the blessing of God. Now this hedge, it, it hedges you in, it surrounds you like a protective barrier, it fortifies your strong city, it keeps your defenses intact so that you can just, uh, you, you don't have to live in worry or fear uh, as people tend to do. You know, the Bible does say God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. How many people uh, in the world today are really living uh, day by day, moment by moment with a sound mind? They're flipping out, freaking out, uh, about ready to lose it, uh, you know, better part of the day. And then God's people are doing that same thing, and it doesn't need to be so. You can have the peace of God, which passes with all understanding. We talk about the peace of God. It was last Sunday morning, but you can have that peace. And uh, it, it, part of it, the way you're going to get it is, you need to be hedged in, like this uh, uh, mess is going to talk about. And we're going to be referring back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 8. So if you would kind of keep it bookmarked with uh, something there. But for now, I want to show you a little bit more about this hedge of protection. And some more insight is given to us in the book of Job, chapter number 1. So let's go there. Job 1, we'll begin in verse number 8. Job 1 and verse 8. And beginning in verse 8, we'll set the stage and, and the scene of what's going on. And, of course, uh, this is where the Lord and Satan are having a conversation in heaven. And God brings up uh, Job. And he says to him in Job 1.8, And the Lord said unto Satan, Has, Satan, hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then... 
uh, Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? And he says this in verse number 10. Hast thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. So that's the question that uh, the uh, devil is asking the Lord. Uh, didn't you do this? Haven't you hedged him by? Haven't you made a hedge about him? And in, answers to, in answer to Satan's question, uh, God had indeed <coughs> made an hedge about Job. And that hedge about Job was a good thing for Job. It was a hedge of protection. Notice in uh, Job 1 verse 10 also, <clears throat> as we go through it a little bit slower, notice what in particular that hedge protected. <clears throat> he says, hast thou not made an hedge about him? So the hedge protected Job himself. Protected Job from harm. Protected Job from, from uh, troubles and difficulties. It protected his health. Just, just protected Job. And he says, not only hast thou, made, hast, thou made, hast, thou not, hast not thou made an hedge about him and about his house. <clears throat> and while we could make application to a physical house, uh, the house there will be more reference to his household, like it is in uh, Acts chapter 1 or Acts chapter 16, verse 31, which says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And then the Philippian jailer's household got saved, his family got saved. That'd be a reference. So Job was protected, his family was protected by this hedge. Not only that, and that has, thou, has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? I mean, everything that Job had, all of his substance, all of his possessions, Job, his family, and all that Job had was protected by this hedge of protection that the Lord had placed around Job. To the end that, it says at the end of the verse, thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. That's why it's happening, because you have blessed him. And so the devil's uh, contention is, you know, why, why shouldn't he fear you? Why shouldn't he? Uh, you, you've got them all protected and everything's good. And, of course, the devil's going to raise the argument. Uh, you put forth your hand now and you start working on Job and you start uh, giving him difficulty. And when it's all said and done, he'll curse you to his face. And so that's, was, that was the contention. But uh, we're not going to get into all of that story. What we want to notice right now is that there was a hedge of protection about him. And inside of this hedge of protection, uh, Job was greatly blessed. Pretty nice hedge of protection Job had uh, right there that God had given him. So uh, I want to ask uh, this question for our consideration. How might we get in on such an hedge of protection and blessing? How is this hedge and protection of blessing, uh, how, how is this given? How is this gained? How can other people get it? How did Job get it? How can we get it? Well, generally speaking, uh, this type of hedge of protection is just is gained by the mercy and grace of God. I mean, just the Lord's grace and mercy. It's like it says in uh, Proverbs 21, 30, the horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. God blesses a thing and it shall be blessed. Uh, the Lord protects a thing and it shall be protected. It's and, and sometimes the Lord just, you know, he just gracious and merciful. And, and he is that's part of his character. And sometimes he bestows that upon us in such ways that, that we deal with an abundance of it and, and thrive in an abundance of it. And that being said, uh, there are some things that you can do that will help to bring about this hedge of protection and or help to keep this hedge of protection intact in your life. Uh, you should note that before God talked about all of that uh, protective blessing and hedge in Job chapter 1, verse 8, uh, it says this about him in chapter 1, and verse number one, the hedge, the hedge, particularly in Job 1.10, before we read about that, in Job 1.1, 1, 1, it says, there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. That was Job's condition. This is what God also said of Job in Job 1.8, that he was at the end of the verse, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now, this is a good thing. And Job uh, was, it's, Job, before we read about his blessing, we read about that being his condition. So it's no coincidence that God had blessed Job and that Job was a perfect and upright man, fearing God and assuming evil. There's, there's no coincidence. There is a connection between the two. Because of the way that Job lived, he brought about the, uh, helped bring about this protection from God. You know, there's no safer place to be than to be right with God. 
and then uh, smack dab in the center of his perfect will. There's no safer place than that. Uh, look, you, you'd be safer in some uh, heathen country in a dangerous place doing the will of God uh, than you would be in what would be deemed a safe place in the United States of America outside of the will of God. I mean, the safest place, wherever God wants you, that's the safest place uh, to be. And uh, on the other hand, there is no more tenuous place to be than to be at odds with God outside of his will, not doing what he wants you to do, not being where he wants you to be when he wants you uh, to be there. In conjunction with being right with God, let me more specifically uh, say another thing that can help you to keep the hedge intact is um, to be obedient to the word of God. You want to keep that hedge intact, you obey his word. Go with me to Psalm 119. Psalms right after the book of Job. 119. And Psalm 119, look at verse 45, which says this. And I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. I'm going to walk at liberty. Inside of the hedge of protection, one can walk at liberty. The hedge hedges you in in a safe haven, uh, a safe haven of blessing and freedom, liberty, safety. Uh, and it protects you from dangerous. It protects you from dangerous things being able to come inside of there, and harming you. In, in yards, uh, this would be like a fence. Some yards are are protected by hedges around about. When I was young, and at one of the place where we grew up before we moved to the place where uh, where my dad built the place, um, between it wasn't a surrounding hedge for us, but between our uh, yard and the neighbor's yard, there was this uh, hedge. And I mean, it was it was great for us, especially playing wiffle ball. I mean, we had natural home run barrier. Of course, I don't know that all the time the um, neighbor liked us going into the yard. We had to be careful about jumping over it. Sometimes we had to look before we went. But but um, generally, we had a pretty good relationship with the neighbor. But but I think if I remember, he had it on the other side as well. And I can't remember if he had it on the backyard or not. But uh, but I, I visualize that, of course, when I think of uh, hedges today. But in this sense. Um, the hedge would go all the way around the yard, maybe meet up with the house. In this sense, uh, if we were to look at the, uh, instead of a hedge, you look at a fence because you see those more often just to get an idea. And in, in yards, fences protect. And it, and it protects. One thing that protects, if you have little kids, it protects those children from uh, running out into the street. And, and it protects them from wandering away from uh, home and, and getting lost when they're playing uh, out there in the yard. And it protects them from stray animals that would like to come into the yard and uh, frighten them or do them harm. And um, if you have uh, uh, a doggy out in the uh, inside of that fence, fenced area, uh, the fence protects that little family dog from di big dogs that would like to come and tear the little dog to shreds. And uh, if, you, if you don't have a fencing yard, you could understand like this, the doggy in the house essentially has that same barrier, barrier of protection. You know, with the windows and the doors. And uh, the house does effectively that same thing. But in either case, you know, a little doggy might fuss and bark and act like he can handle it on his outside, on his own outside of that protective barrier, especially if he sees another doggy coming out there and he's going to, you know, give that doggy what for from the safety of his protective barrier. But there are all kinds of dangers lurking outside of that protective barrier. Outside of the heads are there for their safety and their well-being. And sometimes God's people, uh, bark and complain because they're hedged in by his rules. But God's rules are there for our safety and our health and our blessing and, and our well-being. Why he talks about in the Old Testament how the Lord gave uh, them the commandments. He's given us those commandments for our good. They're for our good because God knows what's good for us. Well, we, th we sometimes think we know what's good for us, but I'll tell you, really knows God knows what's good for us. You want to find out what's good for you? Find out what God has to say. Now look at our verse again, Psalm 119, verse 45. I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. Inside The safest place, really, and where freedom is, is inside that protective barrier. You get outside of it, and, and you get hit by a car. You get attacked by a, a dog or a monster, some sort of monstrous being. I mean, that, that's not safety. That's danger. That's not liberty. That's not freedom. 
So couple this here, here within the framework of the protective barrier, that's where you can run, you can enjoy, you can, you can have safety, there's freedom, there you can breathe, you can enjoy things under the protective blessing of God. Come to John chapter 8 where Jesus gives us another thought that will couple with this. John 8. And in John 8, we'll start in verse 31. John 8, 31. Jesus said, John 8, 31, Then said Jesus of those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth is the thing that will make you free. You want to be free, then you continue in his word. You head yourself in within the framework of the word of God, and you live freely in obedience to what the Bible says. That's where freedom is. Uh, contrarily, uh, Jesus would say, he that committeth sin is the servant of sin. When people think freedom's outside the barriers of doing God's uh, will and doing God's, uh, being obedient to God's word, but it's inside. That's where freedom is. Sin, sin is where slavery is. It's servitude. It's addiction. It's being hooked on something. And, and all sin is addictive. And if you can't say no to sin, that is not freedom. That is not liberty. That is bondage. And the Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood to free you from the bondage of sin. And God gave you uh, commandments and God gave you boundaries and barriers because there's stuff out in this world that will hurt you. And the freedom is within uh, the framework of, of God's word and doing his will. Would you like to have that protective hedge about you? Then obey the word of God. Something else uh, in regard to keeping right with God, uh, specifically obeying the word of God. Uh, another thing, keep sin out of your life. Keep sin out of your life. Remember what we read about Job before we, we heard about his hedge of protection? He was perfect and upright, one that feared God and eschewed evil. Job eschewed evil. Again, what does that mean? Definition, to flee from, to shun, to avoid. Job didn't uh, embrace evil. He fled from it. Like uh, Joseph, uh, when uh, Potiphar's wife had cast uh, her eyes upon him, he ran and fled him, got him out of the house, and he fleed fornication, like the New Testament tells you uh, to do. Uh, keeping sin out helps to keep the blessing in. You want to avoid it. You want to uh, shun it. You want to flee from evil. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. There is no liberty in, fr in freedom and sin. There is bondage in sin. So avoid it. And, and keeping sin out helps keep the blessing in. Keeping sin out helps to keep the hedge intact. Keeping this in mind, let's go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 10 in our text there. Ecclesiastes 10. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 8, end of the verse. And whoso breaketh in hedge, a serpent shall bite him. We're talking about you want to uh, have God's hedge of protection and blessing about you. You want to keep sin out of your life. And he talks about if you break that hedge, a serpent will bite you. This transitions us, keeping this thought of mind, going to transition us into our next main point. Uh, we're speaking again of this hedge of protection. And Solomon tells us something about breaking that hedge. And, uh, and this is where the title of the message comes from, Don't Break Your Hedge. And point number two is very simply that, don't break your hedge of protection. And when you sin, you put a breach in your hedge of protection. You're, you're opening the door. Uh, you, you don't want to open that door. You, you want to keep the danger out. As keeping sin out helps keep your hedge of protection intact, so letting sin in... Uh, that breaks that hedge of protection. Committing a sin puts that break there. Look, the strongest fence is only good if that fence is in good repair all the way around. Uh, if a fence has a broken place somewhere, then anyone or anything can come to that broken place and weasel its way in. Don't break your hedge. Don't do it. You have choices. Look, I'm talking about... I'm talking about something that you have control over. And, and in this particular area, you do. Every one of you has control over it. Your mom doesn't. Your dad doesn't for you, but you do. Your wife doesn't for the husband, but the husband does for himself. 
The husband doesn't for the wife, but the wife does for herself. We, we don't have, look, it's just, it's an individual choice. You can choose to keep sin out of your life or you can choose to let it in. And if you choose to let it in, then you have put a break in that hedge. And that is a dangerous thing. As I said before, not having things right between you and God puts you in a tenuous position. It puts you on shaky ground. Uh, and, uh, and on that shaky ground, it often leaves you overshadowed by angst. As you wonder, you know, if and when that proverbial piano is going to fall down on, out of the sky and land on your head. <laughs> because you just realize something, I, I shouldn't have this going on in my life. It shouldn't be here. And you're kind of just looking over your shoulder. Am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? Am I going to get it? And, uh, boy, that, that's no way. That's not peace. I mean, the angst of impending judgment, I mean, or impending chastisement, uh, it's another reason why the Bible says there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. It's just you, that's no way to live in peace. The hedge. Re remember, this hedge is a good thing. You want to keep it in good repair. It's a good thing. So so quit yapping about it like a little doggy did, you know, wanting to get out. And then don't try to jump the fence and don't try to dig under it or break it down. You dig under it. You, you're not only can you get out, other things can get in. And when you go back in, if you make it back in. It's just a, it's a foolish thing. Once you, once you put a breach in that um, fence, that hedge of protection, you open up your yard to anything that wants to come in. And there are dangerous and harmful things out there. There's dangerous, dangerous and harmful things that, that can get into your life. And look, they're sitting there waiting uh, to rush in as soon as they find an opening. The hedge is for your benefit, it is for your blessing. It's a blessed and wonderful thing to think that, that we could have a hedge of protection about us. Look, we have had a hedge of protection about us. I mean, we'd not be in the blessed position we're in to whatever degree of blessing you experience without the protection, blessing, and safety that's from the Lord. And maybe the enemy's gotten in, and and uh, and but maybe you've let him in. And if so, maybe time to, to get him out and you know fix that breach. Repair that wall like they did in Nehemiah when they repaired the walls of Jerusalem. The hedge is for your benefit. The hedge is for your blessing. The hedge keeps bad out, and it keeps good in. And those are good things. Let me illustrate this. Uh, go to Luke chapter 16. Part of what that hedge does, again, it keeps bad out. And I'll be back to Ecclesiastes, but, but it keeps bad out. It keeps good in. Luke chapter 16. We see there a scene that takes place in the center of the earth where uh, hell is. And at that time, uh, paradise was. Before the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed, paradise was in the center of the earth uh, alongside of uh, hell with a big uh, gulf, a great gulf in between them, separating them. And uh, in Luke chapter 16, you have the rich man dying and finding himself in hell and experiencing the torments of this place. And in Luke 16, 24, uh, it says, this is a rich man, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, there's the rich man in hell. He looks past this great gulf over, and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, and he sees Father Abraham there. So he speaks to him from hell across the great gulf, and Abraham uh, hears. So he, he, he's asking for him to send Lazarus to come and, and give him a little bit of water, just to dip his finger in water and uh, cool his tongue. And here's Abraham's answer, verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. What was the purpose of this great gulf? explains right here, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. So even if Lazarus wanted to come and help you out, he couldn't. And then he said this, neither can they pass to us. So again, here's Abraham over here with Lazarus. Here's the great gulf, and, and here's the rich man in hell. And, he, and Abraham says to him, uh, verse 26, neither can they pass to us from hell, come over to us, Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So nobody from hell could pass through that great gulf and get to paradise. It, there was a barrier. God put a barrier between hell and paradise 
so that people from hell couldn't get into paradise. Do you know why that is? Because if people from hell got into paradise, it wouldn't be paradise anymore. Come to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. After the uh, resurrection of Christ, uh, after his death and the shedding of his blood, uh, even prior to his resurrection, during his burial, uh, the Lord Christ, Jesus Christ came, uh, went up to the third heaven, sprinkled his blood upon the mercy seat, and uh, led captivity captive and, and opened up the way for uh, the souls uh, to get into heaven. And that's where they are today in the third heaven. And there's coming a day when the Lord God is going to usher in uh, new heavens and new earth and new Jerusalem. And when he does that in Revelation chapter 21, look what it says uh, about that in verse number 27. Revelation 21, verse 27. He says, And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, either whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Who gets to heaven? Who gets to enjoy the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem? Uh, those that were written in the Lamb's book of life. And uh, in no wise shall anything else enter into it that defiles, works abomination, or makes a lie. The new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth will be eternally hedged about by the omnipotent power of our almighty God, who's going to see to it that no sin is allowed in that city and nothing defiling or me. God, God, God keeping sin out of heaven. The reason why lost sinners can't go to heaven is because they are sinners and nothing has been done about their sin. And if God allowed a lost sinner to get into heaven, heaven wouldn't be heaven anymore. It would be like this earth that's inhabited with billions upon billions of lost sinners. And you probably have noticed, but this earth ain't heaven. This is not heaven down here. And so God's gonna, God protects him. I'm saying that the hedge, it, it, it not only uh, keeps good in, but it keeps bad out. And God keeps bad out of heaven because, he, because bad would defile heaven. And ultimately, God is going to confine all of the evil in the universe into a lake of fire. Where it, will, where it will stay and, and the rest of the universe will not be defiled by it uh, anymore. And so the Lord uh, sees to it that uh, the hedge of protection uh, will be hedging about heaven forever. And uh, he tries to give you a hedge of protection now, even now, offers it to you down here on this earth. And uh, again, what's wrong with this earth right now? This, this earth, what's wrong with it as a whole is, is sin. You know, and man, man was doing pretty good there. Uh, until sin entered in, which happened in short order. And then when sin entered in, the whole thing fell apart. And look, the, 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 from, the, from the people to the planet, the whole thing fell apart. So in, in similar fashion to what took place on this earth, uh, you better remember as an individual, it's important for you to choose wisely. And when you are faced with temptation and you're teetering back and forth, deciding, well, should I or shouldn't I? Um, you need to remember that when you go ahead and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this sin, that you're opening up a breach in that hedge, opening up yourself to a life of trouble and danger. I'm saying don't break your hedge of protection. When that hedge was busted in the Garden of Eden, uh, evil rushed in. And then they were ousted from the garden and the world, the earth was cursed and Adam and Eve were cursed and their children were cursed. And here we are today. And uh, it's a messed up world because it's filled with messed up people that need to be born again. <laughs> and being born again is a, is a good start uh, to live in a better life. But you're still going to have to grow and give yourself, get yourself in a right relationship with the Lord and maintain that relationship. Don't break your hedge of protection. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27 says this. It says, neither give place to the devil. And when you sin or, or when you break your hedge of protection by uh, sinning or by negligence, you're not keeping up your, your relationship with God. And so you just, you're, you're negligent and you don't keep it strong. What, whatever you do to, to break down the hedge of protection, when you do that, you give place to the devil. And, and you don't want the devil having free access to your life. I'm telling you that right now. It, breaking your hedge gives, gives, breaking the hedge of protection, it gives place to the devil. It's going to lead us to our third point. Back, if you uh, will, Ecclesiastes chapter 10. 
Verse number eight, at the end of the verse, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Point number three, if you break your hedge, you get bit by the serpent. Whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. First off, I don't think getting bit by a snake is on anyone's bucket list. <laughs> and if it is, I guess it would be the last thing on their bucket list. But you break that hedge of protection, you give the serpent easy access to that kingdom that is your life. That kingdom ought to be protected by walls. You ever see walls protecting a castle? I don't know that I've ever seen that in person. Probably, this is going to be a strange illustration, but probably the closest thing I've seen to that is um, going into Attica as a volunteer doing Bible study there. Oh, they got walls there, man. Man, they got walls. Big old uh, stone walls. And the um, only problem is it's not a castle inside. But, but if you could imagine the walls of a castle uh, surrounding the kingdom that, that is your life, Okay, by the grace of God, those things would be protected to, to keep good in and to keep evil out. When you break that hedge of protection, you give the serpent easy access to that kingdom uh, of your life. You know what um, the Lord tells us about our own personal discipline, our own personal uh, maintaining of, of things, right? He says in Proverbs 25, verse 28, he says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So when you don't have self-control to say no to sin and yes to Jesus, to say no to unrighteousness and yes to holiness, to say no to the counsel of the ungodly and yes to the word of God, when you don't have this enough self-discipline to do that, you're like a city that's broken down without walls. You've got to have rule over your own spirit. Paul would say it this way. First of all, he said, I serve or talked about God who said it, who said it, whom I serve with my spirit. And, and, and that's what we do. We serve the Lord uh, with our spirit. And, and with our spirit, Paul would say this, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that any, by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. There was personal self-discipline that, that would tell his body no to what the body wanted to do when it was wrong and yes to what the spirit wanted to do, which was right. You got to have that. And if you don't, you're like a city that's broken down without walls. And if that city has no walls, that wall was a protective barrier to keep the enemy out. And if it's busted down entirely or busted down in any place, I mean, the enemy can just come in and out at will. And as I said before, you don't want the devil having easy access uh, to your life. And we're talking about a serpent biting you. I trust you know that's who we're talking about. We're talking about your adversary, the devil. He's the enemy of the Christian that can come in and out uh, at will when the walls are broken down. Revelation 20 identifies him. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. That's our adversary. Whoso breaketh in hedge, a serpent shall bite him. You don't want to go to battle with the serpent. Jesus went to battle with him. Jesus defeated him. You, you just hang behind Jesus. <laughs> don't, try, don't try to take him on yourself. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking. So you know what he does? He walks about. Picture him walking about your hedge of protection, looking for an opening, looking for a chink in the armor of God looking for a breach in that hedge of sin, looking for a broken down place that hasn't been maintained and kept in good repair. And when he can get through, he'll get through. You want to keep him out. So again, he sees an access point, he enters in. So I'm saying, don't leave any doors open for him. Don't, don't break your hedge of protection. You do, the serpent bites you. And, and what of the serpent's bite? What of it? Well, uh, it poisons you. And, and, and as it poisons you, it's going to make you ill as you feel that poison going through your, your body. And, of course, follow me along spiritually now, right? All right? Now, if you get bit by a venomous snake, these things will happen. But we're talking about a spiritually venomous uh, snake and the serpent, our adversary, the devil. But the poison of our adversary goes through your body and soul and makes you ill. It weakens you. It can make you delirious. That word's too big. 
crazy? Cuckoo. I mean, you can lose your mind. Sin make you lose your mind. It can kill you. Wages of sin is death. It, it robs you of the blessings. You know when a person is is trying and things aren't going the way that they like them to, and they're they really seem to be doing they really seem to be working hard at it and trying, and, and just it just doesn't seem like anything's working out. You know what they sometimes say about that person? They say he's snake bit. Snake bit. Would you rather be blessed or snake bit? I think it's an easy answer. But sometimes you just it just seems like you can't really get any spiritual traction because you've let the adversary in. And, and you want to do your part to get him out. A little further down in Ecclesiastes 10, if you're there, you can take a peek at it. But in verse number 11, it says, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. And the babbler is no better. Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment. You know, you know the one, do you know who the one is that can enchant that serpent and keep him at bay? It's God. It's God. Not you. Like Job says, wilt thou play with him as with a bird? Yeah. No, I don't think it's, I don't think so. Not, you ought not to be. God is the one that can enchant the serpent and hold him at bay. But when you break that hedge, the serpent bites you. Because uh, you break the hedge, when you do, uh, you break the hedge, the Lord, to some degree or another, he'll let that serpent loose on you for a bit. And uh, God's got him in control. God only let him go as far as he'll let him go. But if you break the hedge, you know, you say, okay, I really, I, I want this sin more than I want your blessing, then all right. The Lord lets out the leash a little bit, and to some degree or another, you're going to get bit. You're going to get bit. You'd be wise to work at keeping your hedge of protection in good repair, to, to check it out, to walk the perimeter, to be diligent, to be circumspect, to make sure that it's not falling apart or breaking down because it helps keep the blessing in and the adversary out. I do want to caution you that, that even doing this and staying completely right with God and being obedient to his word, and keeping that hedge in good repair, even doing that does not mean that you will never go through any trouble or difficulty in your life. It does not mean that you will never have to do battle with your adversary, the devil. Sometimes for the Lord's own reasons, God himself might put or allow a break in the hedge and let the serpent bite you as a testing or as a refining uh, that's what was taking place in the book of Job. You know, even the Lord Jesus had to face this. In Genesis 3.15, the Lord speaking to the serpent says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. We know her seed to be a prophetic reference to Jesus coming. And it says, It shall bruise thy head, that is the seed of the woman, Jesus, he's going to bruise the head of the serpent, and thou, the serpent, shalt bruise his heel. No, the serpent bruised his heel. If you will, you think about what Jesus went through, the sufferings uh, on, on earth in this life, in the garden, ultimately leading to Calvary and uh, being nailed to the cross. I mean, uh, he faced some difficulties. He was bit by the serpent, not for his own sin, but for ours. And Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, about what the Lord allowed said of Christ the Son, God, the Son, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And he did. And again, you take our friend Job. You know, God saw fit to remove the hedge from Job for a time without a cause. And he would acknowledge this, that the devil moved him against Job without a cause. And we read all about this in the book of Job. But again, sometimes the Lord, he let the devil in to try you. Um, but even in such times, folks, the safest place for you to be is in the will of God, in a close relationship with the King of Kings, nestled safe, safely close to him, snuggled up close for, for uh, being under his protective uh, wings, if you will. Would you go with me to Psalms? Back from Ecclesiastes, Psalm 91. Watch the protection of uh, our great God for his own. Psalm 91. Psalm 91. And look, at, I know that uh, bad things can happen to good people. It did to Job. I know that even in the New Testament church age, bad things can happen to good people. Uh, Stephen was martyred, but uh, I'll tell you what, he was at peace. 
John the Baptist was martyred uh, prior to, to, to that, was killed for preaching, but uh, well, God gave him God gave him peace, and they did it. They might attain a better resurrection, and in the whole time, the grace of God was upon them. And in Psalm 91, what, when outwardly you might be falling apart or things might be falling apart, and you're close to God, inwardly there's a protection and a peace. And Stephen, before he was killed, looked up and said, I, I saw, he saw heaven open, and, and the, Son of, uh, man, the Son of God standing at God's right hand. I mean, he, he saw Jesus standing there. And the Lord, will, he'll take care of you. But look at Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. That's what I'm talking about. Nestled close within uh, him. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the safe place to be. I'll say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Watch this. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Why? Because he's safe under the protective uh, refuge of his God. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the adder, and uh, he says, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. Because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. We may as well finish it out. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. That's what I'm talking about. Even if you do go through trouble and the Lord does let the serpent bite you and he refines you and tests you and tries you. He said, I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? The Lord will eventually deliver. That is a, a place within the protective blessing of God, even in, even in difficult times, if he, if he allows it to preach himself. I want you to contrast that and compare it to a situation where the, the hedge has been broken down by um, the people and their own foolishness. Back to Psalm 80. Psalm 80, 8 0. Look at verse 4. Now we're gonna this is gonna lead up to a, a revelation that their hedges were broken down. So with that in mind, in verse number four, Psalm 80, O Lord God of hosts, how long? Those of you in Sunday school remember that question. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparedest room before it, and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. This is what it was like when the hedges were intact. She sent out her boughs under the sea and her branches under the river. Verse 12. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges? So that all they which pass by the way do pluck her. God broke them down because of their sin and Israel's worshiping of other gods. And now he says, the boar out of the wood doth waste it and the wild beast of the, of the field doth devour it. Now you're better off within the verses of Psalm 91 than you are within these verses here in Psalm 80. And um, uh, this leads me to the, the last thing I want to say, and that is, if first of all, I'm telling you, don't break your hedge. But the last thing I want to say, if you do break your hedge, repair it ASAP. If for some reason you break it, a just pan falls seven times and rises up again. Get up and fix it. As soon as possible, you want to fix it. You know, Israel's, as we read here, Israel's being pummeled in Psalm 80. And not only was Asaph 
acknowledging her desolation, but at the same time, he was interceding to God. Remember how he said, turn us again, O God, in verse number seven. In the, in the verse after the last one we read, he would say it again in verse 13 or verse 14. He'd say, return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. And then specifically turn us again in verse 19. He would pray it again. But he's asking God, he's interceding for the Lord to come and, and fix things for him. And so I'm saying to you, you know, God, he wants you to do right. He wants you to stay right. He wants you to make sure you don't break your hedge. And I'm saying, don't break it. Don't break it. But if in a moment of weakness, this is no excuse for weakness. I'm, I mean, it's, it's always better not to break it. But if you falter and fail, you need to get that thing fixed up as soon as possible. God, God, God does it. He, he, ex, he sets a standard. He exhorts you to do right. He tells you to do right. He wants you to stay right. He exhorts you to that end. And yet he knoweth our frame. He remembered that we are dust. And so if we fall, he makes provision for us. If we, if we falter, he, he makes a way that we can be restored. He sets a standard high, but then he reaches down his hand to restore us when we fall short. And to that end, he says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. That's what God wants. He wants his people not to sin. Why? Because sin's no good for you. And sin lets the devil in. And he says, these things write unto you that you sin not. Period. The verse is not over, but it puts a period there. That's his perfect will right there. That's what he wants. But the next thing he says is, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He said, I don't want you to sin. You're better off if you don't. But if you do. You better get yourself to that advocate and get yourself there quickly. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's, it's best to keep things right with God. But if you falter, it's best to keep accounts, accounts short with God. That is, get it right as soon as possible. You say, when is that? As soon as you recognize you've done wrong and you, you get yourself ready and repent and confess it and get it right. Get that relationship restored. And again, that's what uh, they're trying to do in Psalm 80. You take uh, Israel being under the, the issues that she was dealing with there in Psalm 80. In verse number 12, it said that uh, it was because the hedges were broken down. He said, why hast thou then broken down her hedges? Again, because of her sin. That's, that's what, why it was broken down. But the case she was in, look, I look at that as for a nation of Israel. I fear this for America as well. Because as a, as a nation, we've, we've let our guard down. Now, it's not our choice as individuals here. We, we choose to keep that guard up. When you let down the guard of, of morality and holiness and righteousness, man, you're just giving, you're putting a break in that spiritual wall and inviting the enemy to come in. And certainly the litany of troubles we've had as a nation from time to time, uh, so many of them can be traced back to just that, to the breaches of immorality that our country ha has uh, let in to break down her hedge of protection. Let us never forget that righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And we find ourselves as a nation in much the same condition as Israel in uh, times of the Old Testament. Like uh, it says in, um, for example, Isaiah 5, verse 25, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people. And he has stretched forth his hand against them, and has smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this... His anger is not turned away, but his hand is outstretched still. It's a mess, but he's still got his hand stretched out. As God stretches out his hand, what he's looking for, he's looking for somebody to stand up, stand up for Jesus. He stretches out his hand. Do you know what he's looking for? Before I tell you, I'll introduce it by saying this. Our text in Ecclesiastes 10.8 is probably not the most famous verse in the Bible about the hedge. Probably the most famous verse in the Bible about the hedge is Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse number 30. And that verse tells what, what the Lord is looking for as he reaches out his hand. That verse says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And then at the end of the verse, he had to confess this. But I found none. 
And I believe the Lord, He's still looking for that kind of man in our country, in every country today. Well, wouldn't you like to be that man? Wouldn't you like to be that one? Wouldn't you like to be that kind of a woman, that kind of a, a young person, one who stands in the gap for God? What are you looking for? There's breaches there. You Lord need some folks to stand in the gap. We're talking about your own personal life, first of all, but we're also talking about just what we could do in the work of God. And those who stand in the gap for God uh, will stand with Bibles. Those who stand in the gap for God will stand in righteousness. Those who stand in the gap for God will stand with God in spite of the world's positions on uh, given matters. Th those who stand in the gap, they'll stay close to God. They'll maintain a right relationship with God. Uh, they'll do their part to keep their own personal hedges of protection in good repair. That's what the Lord will do. You keep sin and, and you keep sin out, and you keep righteousness in. You, you you keep yourself compassed about with that hedge of protection by the grace of God, by by doing what you're supposed to do, being where you're supposed to be, uh, when you're supposed to do what you're supposed to do, do that. When you're supposed to be where you're supposed to be, do that. Keeping sin out, keeping right relationship with God, keeping the the hedge maintained. And keep thy heart, again, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And this will help you to incur the blessing of God upon your life. Because there is indeed a hedge of protection uh, to be desired, folks, to be desired. One, one of the reasons that I, I, I fear allowing sin is, is given access to the adversary to come in. And, and he's called a thief and a robber. And he'll steal my blessings. And, and he will rob me of my peace and my relationship uh, with God. And I, I say it again, I'm done. The safest place for you to be and the most blessed place for you to be is close to God, uh, dwelling there under the shadow of his wings with the king of kings inside the hedge of his protection. So don't break your hedge, folks. Don't break your hedge. It's better to be hedged in with God's blessing uh, than to be snake bit. So don't break your hedge. Let's bow our head. Bow our heads, close our eyes. Father, in Jesus' name, you are a good God, and I thank you, Lord, that um, you don't leave us helpless down here, and I pray that you would take these things, apply them now to individuals wherever they need it, and Lord, help your people to do their part uh, to keep that hedge intact around their own lives. In Jesus' name. Our heads about our eyes are closed. We preach the message directly to Christians, and if the Lord spoke in your heart, we invite you to come talk to him about it do some work with God. Let him do some work with you. Determine maybe there's a breach you need to repair. Maybe um, maybe it's uh, getting weak and you need to strengthen it. Maybe uh, you've been contemplating, Lord, just uh, putting a breach in there. And, and just you need to ask the Lord to help you not to resist uh, temptation, resist to evil, and resist the devil that he might flee from you. But here I want to say this. If you are not saved, if you don't know the Lord as your Savior, Jesus, he, he first and foremost is that hedge, and you need your soul protected by that hedge, and he'll protect your soul for all of eternity. So if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know you're on your way to heaven, we invite you uh, to come. Let me know. Let us help you uh, come to know him. Father, I do pray your blessing upon our time of invitation. I pray you'd use it. Maybe in these next few moments, instead of just uh, shutting down and running off, maybe we keep tuned in and uh, do some business with thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, and some music plays.
Thank you, Father, for the word of God, the word of truth. And I pray you help us to live in light of these words. And let um, I commit this message to you. I pray let just let the truth linger. And, and may the Spirit of God apply it and remind us of it when we need it. And may we just work and labor to, to do what we've talked about today, to keep that hedge of protection intact the best that we can, for as much as it is in our power, uh, Lord, to keep your blessings uh, in, keep our adversary and the dangers and the harms out. Teach us these things and uh, help us to be aware when we're about to break it. Speak to our heart. Give us your grace. Bless the people, Lord, as uh, everybody goes their way, get them safely to their destination. And we ask as we look forward to evening service for your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen.